Hello and welcome back. Unfortunately, in all of my paying close attention to what I'm doing and recording <laughs> my audio flawlessly and, and re-recording things several times to perfect it and not because I utterly muted myself for the whole time and messed up the audio and I also realized I went to publish this and I was like, wait a minute, where's five? I must have, I must have, or where's six? I mean, I must have, have done six and then I realized I didn't. I didn't, so here we go. It's a 32 minutes. It's called a deep dive into the tech and phase one rollout strategy. Okay. Let's see how much is the tech and how much is the rollout strategy. Hello, I'm Malcolm Bendor, and I'm continuing on the series, section six, relating to you the uh, operation of the plasmoids and MSAT plasmoids with their application to the internal combustion engine. We'll be looking at several sections here, and I'll run right through them. Where uh, seamlessly there's been one section which will deal with petrol, diesel, and gas, and kerosene sources of heat that are used, as I've said before, inefficiently because you know, for every dollar you put into your car, uh, so every three dollars put in your car, one dollar goes to running the car, and two dollars goes to polluting the planet. So, and with this technology, three dollars of petrol, two dollars goes to running a car, and one dollar goes to replenishing the earth and putting more oxygen in the air, therefore my ozone eventually into the ozone layer, and making the, the atmosphere a strong negative charge which keeps our ionosphere in place. So anyway, so here's the section six petrol retrofit, and this is me with the uh, the big, the first industrial scale application of this after having successfully conceived and applied the technology, I simply scaled them up. And uh, these are 24 inch spheres here, and there's two of them, and they have an 18 inch sphere inside. And basically, again, this is a thunderstorm generator on the top. This is the exhaust stack for the, uh, this caterpillar motor, which is actually a, uh, a gas motor uh, running off natural gas. And so I've got the appropriate compression ratio for that. So it's a, a gas to find as a, a G3508E, it's an electronic motor. So basically, that's after the bill. I'll go through and explain this setup in later slides. But again, you can go to Strike Foundation on Earth to get the, the notes as to the theoretical principles that's working on. Fuck the system. The scientific <laughs> documentation of the <laughs> Next. So here's a retrofit of a car, this is a, uh, we put up the top simply for demonstration purposes. This would be normally uh, the size and the position of a normal muffler. Fundamentally, we just uh, the exhaust gases introduced in, into these two spheres that are put together with a four inch pipe. And here on the outside, this is a, uh, an eight inch pipe with the eight inch spheres. And so, and again, it operates. That copper, it looks almost hot. As a charger of the uh, plasma that's generated in. <coughs> this looks like copper, so that's probably copper. These uh, elements here. Are so now we have a different material. Through them, and which uh, the plasma generator. So, plasma generator, plasma charger, and obviously it goes into the uh, carburetor where it uh, discharges. So, next. So, here is a clearer. Oh, it looks more like a rubber now. Demonstration, so here, these are two spheres, uh, just simply with a cylinder here, two eight spheres. You have the, uh, these are actually the, uh, the uh, plasmoid generators and bubblers, and they generate the plasmoids, and the plasmoids are then brought around and put through uh, this way, counter to the exhaust which is coming through here. So, so basically, the, uh, what? the exhaust um, where we you mean with that? I think he's got it backwards again. Like it must go this way so that it goes counter to this. But that doesn't make sense. This valve up here goes into here. This goes down around here somewhere. Monitor the gas pump. Here's the gas pump here with the printout. 
and these are uh, Formula One. It's like they're flowing together in this one, though. Racing grade, temp approved, calibrated, industry standard, uh, five gas uh, analyzers. So you've got an analyzer for oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, NOx, and hydrocarbon. So basically, the next slide. Here's from the other angle where you see the uh, the uh, the plasmoids being injected in and the uh, exhaust gases coming coming out of here. The input of the exhaust gases is the other side, and this is the exit of the exhaust gases. Is where okay. this is where the bolt hole here's where we measure, and here's the uh, water in these tubes that are actually creating the plasmoids. And that's actually the uh, plasmoid generator here and uh, the water trap there to stop any water from going directly into the motor. So get a different angle. Uh, you see that again the. Uh, Plasma generated water trap, and the fact that it comes out here and around there, and you can see the uh, the manifold with exhaust gases coming up, running through the system. You know, it's it's, uh, it's been prevent any water from going in the motor. Isn't the water steam that is like carrying the plasmoids that must go in the motor to use it? I just don't understand. Gases gases here here. And it's probably because it doesn't make any sense, but to the center comes the uh, point five with the gas <coughs> order and space and goes around. I think Joe Rogan needs to publish that, Joe. Please. Down here, and then <laughs> the interview. The Let us see it. Inside. Let us see you asking the hard questions that he couldn't really answer. Again, just a different view, just showing the. Uh, and maybe confusing the inlets and outlets and being blatantly obvious about not knowing even what he's talking about in the engine itself. Uh, well, this is more specific shows that the input here into the intake of the engine of the uh, charge plasma ones that are coming out of this thunderstorm generator here to be discharged in the yeah, pistons of the engine. So the thunderstorm generator here is really fucking big. Engine. Again, just another view of that. Next. So this is a video that we won't watch here, but you can watch it on the um, on our website at uh, uh, well, you can go to hypoliformation.org. Uh, now, here's the results, which are very instructive. Now, we run these at different RPMs, rate rows per minute, and uh, we've taken the analysis of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, hydrocarbon, and NOx. So you can see here the normal uh, amount of CO2 produced is 14%. It's our baseline, and that's at 600 revs, 1100 revs, 14.5, uh, 2000 revs, 14.4, 14.6, 14.6. So basically, the higher revs, it's basically equalize out. Now, what you'll see here is dramatic, is that if you're running just at idle, you go drop from 14% CO2 down to 0.9 of a percent. And so, and here's the carbon monoxide. In this case, is 0.2 normal operating system to 0.06 which is up, up slightly, but it's at idle where our system uh, works on velocity and it's not working to its full extent. But here's the clincher. You've only got 0 0.13 oxygen, but you've got 19.5% oxygen coming out. So with our technology, which means that's the level of oxygen just in normal air in any city. So it means that instead of using up all the oxygen and having no oxygen in the air coming out of the car, you've got atmospheric levels of oxygen. So when you Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I caught it pretty quick. <clears throat> I was going to say, oh, dude, if that's the percentage in air, like, no. <laughs> so it means that instead of using up of oxygen and having no oxygen in air coming out of the car, you've got atmospheric levels of oxygen. So when you go up to 3,000 resume, here you've got the CO2 I see, I see. dropping down to 1.3%. You've got the carbon monoxide at zero again. Again, though, like you're adding air and then you're analyzing the what passes through this this system and it has air added. I mean, it doesn't make sense. What's the percentage of carbon dioxide in air? It's like parts per million. Point oh four, so he's basically about like introducing air, which greatly reduces this. 
introducing error, which greatly increases this, and then pointing at the values as if they matter. And then just the same for these, introducing error. I'm not sure why this goes up. That's a, a little odd, the CO. Carbon mon monoxide goes up consistently across them all. Consistently up. Going up to point zero seven percent, but still, that's actually what's the word? That's uh, at such low levels that's inconsequential. But actually, what we're doing here is what's happening, and which is just a funny thing about this technology. Inconsequential. 0.07% is not inconsequential if it's not supposed to be there. Like, clearly, the engine itself is designed by, by people who are making it approach zero. So then he's introducing this system that's adding a substantial amount that then I believe is being reintroduced into the system, I'm not completely sure. Otherwise, what's the point? Confused the device with plasmoids, so they're working even before we turn, but the system coming through the exhaust pipe, we're already reducing down the CO2. And so, funnily enough, that's you know, an artifact of what's happening here. But anyway, the bottom line is that you've got a dramatic reduction in the amount of CO2, and you see that in all the test results, and this is just one sample, but we've had the same with the uh, gas and kerosene jet engines. It's the same result every time, because it's a fundamental reaction to scale. It's, it's consistently the same result when we add air. It looks like we added air. Well, they're not, <coughs> and the principles are the same at any scale. So you don't have to worry about scaling problems with this technology, it's infinitely scalable, you know, both down and up. Next. So here's the, uh, the normal layout of a six cylinder motor, which is the one you just saw, the forward. So, and you see the exhaust gas comes out and it escapes out along here and goes down here to the uh, manifold and to the, uh, so into the, uh, uh, through the muffler. Opposing that in opposite direction, you have a UV uh, air filter and a UV light. You have a plasmoid generator here, a plasmoid generator again, and a water trap. Um, here to make sure no water gets through to the motor in, in its liquid form, then it all comes through its uh, gas phase. And then it comes around here, goes into the carburetor, and uh, that the then is there, flows directed into the pistons, obviously where it's combusted. <coughs> even if it, even if, let's say, he's able to add plasmoids over here, and then this water uh, comes through in the gas phase and enters the system only in the gas phase and any liquid water is trapped. Then the gas water goes through and then it enters here and it goes down here, it goes through here and the plasmoids are used and it goes down here. I presumably it then goes back this way and just cycle, like it's trapped. The water becomes trapped so it is in the engine, and even if it stays as gas, while there's plasmoids in it, like at some point it's going to lose its staying as gas nature that is being induced on it by as the like plasmoids presumably dissipate because they're not stable like normally. They're not just like passively existing they're like having to be created and then whether or not they're stably existing eternally is highly unlikely so even if they're being created they probably dissipate across time and then the water that w was in a gaseous state at a low temperature and pressure because of their presence actually begins to liquefy And then it's in the engine. I don't see how it wouldn't be in the engine. Let's maybe go back a little bit. Here to make sure no water gets through to the motor in, in its liquid form, then it all comes through in its uh, gas phase. And then it comes around here, goes into the carburetor. And, uh, <coughs> I just want to make sure he said that it does, in fact, come through in the gas phase. That, but then it's there, goes <coughs> directed into the pistons, obviously where it's combusted along with the, uh, the petrol from the carburetor, when the, the exhaust has recited, then it's considerably improved in its composition. 
Okay, so maybe it exhausts out here to a degree. I'm still a little concerned at... I see the exhaust now, pardon me. I'm still a little skeptical, especially if there's a flow here that's forcing flow this way. Like, unless this whole... Ex unless there's an exhaust, <clears throat> like, to it all, to each one, a total exhaust, then, like these ones aren't getting cleansed as much. Next. So I guess it would have to be an exhaust more so at the sixth piston. So again, this is a variation on that design. And uh, just as conceiving... <coughs> oh, I see the exhaust is going outside, heat exchanging with the inflow. and then exhausting across the barrier of this chamber by going around it and then exhausting here. I see, I see. So it does go down. Okay, okay. This is actually like generally how heat exchange would be designed is probably more the engine itself with an inlet that then has this additional design then. So maybe this is just how the air comes in. Testing different, different designs to see uh, which is more efficient for that particular engine because different engines work at different uh, RPMs, whereas for a minute they have different amounts of air coming through them. So this is sort of a design to cope with uh, your high velocities. I really don't think that gas, water, and pistons of an engine makes sense. So it would be in a uh, Formula One type racing car as opposed to. At least not one that's designed for gas, gasoline. <laughs> Etc. An internal combustion engine. Which would be able to run at higher speeds. The next. So here again. Let me just see what this was. I guess something sphere cone. Uh, your high velocities. So it would be in a uh, Formula One type racing car as opposed to your normal car, which would be able to run at higher speeds. The next. So, I, okay, okay, here's a cross section, I guess, of these. Retrofit. Here again, uh, with the basic cutoff spheres, so we can fit them together and exhaust the maximum inlet height. into spheres. This by one big sphere, and you'll see that on the other diagrams you saw that on the car. Uh, but this is how you can sort of just take off the manifold, uh, melt it, and then recast it as this design, and that's very simple. It, it just uses your current manifold, so you don't have to you don't have to mine any more iron or smelt any more iron. It's just, because you can't, it's going to be phased out anyway. You take that off, you, you re it and put it back on again. So that's why this is very, very kind to people that have already purchased cars and then it does give the, you know, even in the process of doing this, you're recycling the products that have already been built. So uh, next. So here's different designs where you can have different sphere size. You can collect the gases into one sphere, or it's three spheres, or you can collect into one sphere. Again, it's very flexible. It's just these are different designs depending on the engine space, for example. Yeah, if you've got a ship or a uh, big truck, you've got more engine space or more physical space to put the engine in. So these are just the different conceptual designs that we've been testing in. The next. Yeah, so this is the actual uh, the layout of the sphere that you just saw on the car. There's, this is a uh, torch by 8-inch. A sleeve. This is to sort of confine the heat and the resonance within this cavity. You have here a, a, a six inch by two inch and four inch by three inch pipes, and you've got the internal six inch pipe. And so basically, the exhaust comes up here, goes through the system, and then exits here. So anyway, that's the basic schematic of what we're seeing. Next, so here's a um, the schematic showing a, a different design, completely different design, not using spheres, but using the same principles of 16 parts, no, so 16 points of energy. And the, the granulations here would create a more, more discharge points for the technology. So, so basically you have the positive exhaust gas here, positive charge. These are positive charge on this side, a negative charge on this side. This makes this a particle accelerator where these are accelerating together, but this goes on further. So the zero point is here where the positive and negative hit each other. As, as, as in the public sphere, sphere, you've got the concept of positive and negative on the sphere, 
on the equatorial plane. So it creates a uh, infinity symbol, you know, so you've got an impotent sphere on the equatorial plane. What we saw earlier was an impotent sphere down on the south pole that the North Pole has been floating, which is the Molten Sea, which is where I got design ideas for how to produce a plasma generator. So here you've got the gases, same as CO2, they come through, and this is where these collide. It creates a zero point, therefore, when you have positive and negative, one spinning one direction, one spinning the other, or you know, force of the universe travels in a curved line, and recurves either an implosion or an explosion. So basically, when they hit, they stop and create a zero point plane here, which is our event horizon plane, as you call in quantum physics. So therefore, the CO2 comes in here, hits the event horizon plane. There's no frequency allowed there, so therefore, it's a so event horizon plane. I mean, I know of a black hole event horizon, which is not really quantum. It's general relativity based. It's not the same. I don't think there's any other event horizon. It reassembles itself as oxygen. So that's a very simple. And again, you have the same ratios, 4, 3, 2, which is 4 inch, 3 inch, and 2 inch, which is related to the 4, 3, 2, which is time itself, which is 43,200 seconds in a day on the summer solstice, and 43,200 seconds of light. This also relates to the 4, 3, 2, which is the, um, the 43,200 scale model of the uh, planet, which is the pyramid. So I want to 43,200, so it's the same. Same basic ratios and numbers which makes this a resonant cavity and with the 16 parts to it. And it's going up in octaves here. So basically, it means that this assists in the catalytic effect of the stainless steel of that reacting with the plasmoids. So next, I think this is the same again, compared just with again this area here, just as a transparency so you can see that it's actually a, a you know, like a hologram or a virtual plane, you would not be able to see that in real terms with your eye. Again, it's just running through quickly the different angles of that design. Next. So the pre-ionization chamber, as I said, you know, that is the uh, preconditioning, uh, preconditioning plane imprint device on the air as well as exciting the argon in the air so that it will go to a higher state of energy, which is more reactive, and it comes back through here, the plasma generator, which is actually full water, and it has a diffuser down here, and it creates the uh, microbubbles, which then implode on the, um, the he releases the vacuum. So, and those exploded bubbles and water in its gas phase come through the center of the thunderstorm generator, opposing, opposite and opposed to the hot uh, exhaust, dry exhaust gas, so that creates a thunderstorm. And the zero point's around about this point in the, this is normally an octave 144 or 24. And I said there's a 432 ratio for the spheres. So, anyway, so that, and then obviously goes into the carburetor of the engine and then in the engine itself, the uh, waste heat energy here is turned into an effective fuel by the plasma winds that generate here, uh, storing that charge and then discharging that charge inside motor. So this is just a uh, summary of that, the pre ionized I'm just really thinking about that water. Air is drawn into the chamber by a vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be pretreated before it enters the plasmoid generator. It is pretreated by exposing the air to ultraviolet light at a specific frequency of 100 microhertz. I forget that symbol. I'm pretty sure it's micro. <laughs> Uh, this frequency is determined by the frequency of ultraviolet light emitted from collapsing bubbles within our generator. Plasmoid generator. Molten sea something arc. Plasmoid generator. This frequency is determined by the frequency of ultraviolet light emitted from collapsing bubbles. So the air is exposed to a frequency, which is the frequency emitted by coll from collapsing bubbles within the generator.
The bubbles collapse violently as they are exposed sequentially to both vacuum and pressure pulses resulting from the movement of pistons within the combustion chamber. This has the effect of making the gases more reactive by ionizing a small percentage of each gas present in the air. Did you call that nanometers? I don't think that's nanometers. Into the chamber by vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be pretreated before it enters the plasma generator. It's pretreated by exposing the air to ultraviolet light at a specific frequency of 100 nanometers. This frequency is determined by the frequency of ultraviolet light. Yeah, it's micrometer. From the collapsing bubbles. It's micrometer. He said nanometer. Remember by vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be pre pretreated before it enters the plasma generator. It's pretreated by exposing the air to ultraviolet light at a specific frequency of 100 nanometers. This Like, it's one thing for me reading it as not the person presenting it to not know off the top of my head whether that's nanometers, micrometers, or something else. But it's another for someone using it and apparently using it in a rigorous way where they, like, fine-tune the frequency of light emitted by collapsing violent bubbles, by violently collapsing bubbles that are created by pulses in this combustion of the combustion chamber, which then ionize the gas. But all of this depends on, is determined by the frequency of ultraviolet light emitted by the collapsing bubbles. But then, like, before the collapsing bubbles even form, mind you, the collapsing bubbles are happening here. Here it's being treated, becoming ionized, and then collapsing bubbles. So back here, it is being ultraviolently treated by a hundred micrometer wavelength of light. Is that even... Uh, where is that? Infrared. So maybe he meant nanometers and this action. Maybe. 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 <laughs> maybe. Hilarious. There's so many things of this nature where it's like, well, maybe he actually meant nanometers and this. Like, he knew it meant nanometers, but the slide. The slide said 100 micrometers. Nanometers is just NM. A hundred nanometers would be, I mean, it's, it's just not, it's an x-ray then. Like, it's not even in the ultraviolet frequency period. Ultraviolet is only this range. Point two four micrometers. That's that's point two four micrometers to nanometers. It's I think two forty. Yeah. Okay. So like, is not. It would have to be an X-ray. This is an X-ray. If it's nanometers, 
And if it's not nanometers, if it's actually micrometers, then it's infrared, which neither of them are ultraviolet. This is literally not an ultraviolet frequency. So, so, apparently, it is pre-treated by an ultra, ultraviolet light at a, at a non-ultraviolet frequency. And this frequency, they realized, he realized, had to be the frequency that was inserted into this chamber to the air as the air went through. This light radiates it, and only then does the air appropriately influence the bubbles so as to make this process work, based on what he's saying. Here, pre-treated by exposing the air to the specific frequency, this frequency is determined by the frequency emitted by the collapsing bubbles as they are exposed, like... I mean, the mere fact that this is not ultraviolet, regardless, I would say is conclusive proof that this is bullshit. And the bubbles collapse by and they're exposed to vacuum pressure, so the effect of making the gas more reactive. Ionizing a small percentage of each gas present in the air, nitrogen, oxygen, and portly odor, which is 1% of our atmosphere. So the argon is very important because it will hold the charge next. So, so here's the, the uh, plasma generator. generator. Has, has a cone, cone at each end, mirror image, image here. And, and so, so basically, the ionized gas, gas enters, enters the bottom, bottom here and exits, exits the top. And, and it, this is where the water is here. And this is just the schematic for that. Next. So, so thunderstorm generator. Function is to charge the MSAT plasmoids. The air is drawn into the chamber by a vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be pre treated before it enters the plasmoid generator. It is pre treated by exposing the air to ultraviolet light at a specific frequency of 100 emitters. This frequency is determined by the frequency of ultraviolet light emitted from collapsing bubbles within our MSAT plasmoid generator. The bubbles collapse violently as exposed sequentially to both vacuum and pressure pulses resulting from the move of the pistons within the combustion chamber. This is the effect of making the gases more reactive by ionizing each gas present in the air, nitrogen, oxygen, argon. The thunderstorm... <coughs> he said nanometers again. This is... A, I was thinking, is this the same slide, but this is actually the thunderstorm generator. So, to charge the plasmoids, air... Uh, I can't even follow him reading, pardon me, sir. Air is drawn into the chamber by a vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be treated, pre-treated pre before it enters the plasmoid generator. Okay. Vacuum emanating from the engine. Is that just how air is drawn in generally? I don't I honestly know. Or it probably, it probably has a pump. Air, in, or just air intake, engine, mechanics, I don't know. Air in, intake system, how it works. Pump. Pump water. Okay, not... Okay, so it probably just draws it in by just physics and <laughs> not not like a in a specific design just an opening that allows for it to happen i guess so that's pretty much vacuum emanating from the engine that is to be pre-treated before it enters the plant so then the air needs pre-treated by this frequency that's not ultraviolet this frequency is determined by the frequency of some light that's somehow not ultraviolet the bubbles collapse violently as they are exposed sequentially. Okay, so this is pretty much the same. This has the effect. I don't know. The thunderstorm generator creates lightning by opposing hot and dry exhaust gas spinning out with an anti-clockwise exploding vortex. 
<clears throat> against cold, moist air spinning into a clockwise imploding vortex. That kind of concept I can see the potential in more so than something that seems to not even be in the ultraviolet light spectrum and is just not even the units that he's saying. Like, that to me is just proof. Proof. I, um... Like, this is just someone who's thought about stuff. But up here, this is someone who doesn't really understand what they're talking about. Out with an anti-clockwise exploding vortex against cold, moist air spinning into a clockwise imploding vortex. The uh, plasmoids are charged due to the action of the thunderbolts on the water in its gas phase. Next. So, so here's, here's uh, uh, basically, basically the big in its gas fire. Due to the action <coughs> of the thunderbolts on the water. <coughs> the thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. And Galileo. Galileo. Next. Galileo Figaro. So here's... Uh, Magnifico. Basically, the big gate upon the small two small gates, gates, which is in all ancient technologies, ancient buildings, pyramids around the world, and also any spiritual building will have the concept of a big gate and two small gates. So, again, we have exactly the same principle opposing hot exhaust gases opposing. What a great song. Oh my god. <laughs> like, what are the odds to be born, like, pretty much right after Bohemian Rhapsodies, like, exists? In that little window. Just in that window, because, you know, there's gonna come a time all things are lost. But not right now, and we in that window, boys, girls. We all. How many people driving down the road, <laughs> screaming Bohemian Rhapsody for the hundredth time? I don't even know. So <laughs> So again, just reiterating that we've just gone through these three elements: uh, pre-ionization chamber, plasma generator, thunderstorm generator. And that drives the motor and makes it uh, pollution free and with twice the energy. Next. So here, uh, we're just diverting a little bit back to basics, but it's important because what you've got to understand is that what we're dealing with here is crystal form. So carbon itself, as in hydrocarbons, has a 90 degree angle. And this is how you can calculate the frequency of. Carbon by this is a visualization of an octave that is it's a visualization of one eighth of a sphere. So and when you change to 45 degrees, this creates a, a pyramid type structure, and 22 and a half degrees another structure, and then point two five degrees another structure again. Uh, some structures. This one, this one looks kind of like a pyramid. Some other structure. This structure. <laughs> My point being is that that it's a relationship. I'm sorry to mock you, man. Pardon me. It's rude. Even if you're just making shit up. Same. I guess I've made a lot. Of, I've probably made a lot of things up since things were false along the way. Like anything that was false along the way, I pretty much made it up. And I've certainly not been in like a hundred percent. Like so I, I think of it more like a baseball player that has a high batting average. Like a good batting average in baseball is anything over three hundred, three out of ten. You know, four out of ten is like 
all-star MVP, like, best of the best, all-time hitting, like, good. So, like, it doesn't even take half the time to be one of the best in baseball, and, I mean, we're talking about a sport of, like, truth, where basically everyone's wrong, so, I mean, to even get anything right is fucking sweet. Anyway. Again, going back to uh, Randall Carlson, his sacred geometry, it, and around the world, for all these ancient structures, you'll see repeated time and time again, these fundamental principles of the... Uh, of all the numbers adding up to nine, like their sacred geometry. Numerology's there. All that up to nine. I'm an asshole. I'm sorry, dude. And also, <laughs> if you're dealing with carbon at 90 degrees, then the frequency related to that will, you can visualize and create that as a, as a time space. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Every time, space. Let's try. It. Let's try. So when you go to model the elements, you lay them oh, hard on camera. Presentation. You'll see how that's done. Also, you can refer to the presentation in StrikeFoundation.org, where it goes through with a video showing you how the model of the elements is constructed and how we calculate the resonant frequency using this principle of folding time space. Okay. Next. So, so here again, just to emphasize that, that although some of these appear the same, it's actually some of them uh, just, just because they're rotating. rotating. So, so here's all the different angles that related, related to sacred geometry, geometry and the 16 segment sphere. Next. Here's uh, the, the motor, motor running, running in America, in Ketchikan, Alaska. It's a uh, mechanical engineer who's put together the motor, motor just, just on my instruction, and, and uh, it worked exactly perfectly well. <coughs> I feel like he didn't design any of this and just generally gave them like these kinds of lectures and then they used their own skills to make them. I don't know, is that what happened, Malcolm? You clarify, please. Tested. And him and his brother, they both qualified. qualified. Um, mechanical engineers, and they did the test work simply with tubes of petrol, testing it under load with normal running of the motor, and testing it under load with the motor running but with the plasmoid technology on it. So uh, they recorded a 77% increase in performance of the motor, with just with that, which is uh, very basic. So, so here's the firing sequence. Just I'm aware of that. Vajra. We can use it's really not a Vajra. Vajra. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. I know it ain't one, though. As um, <laughs> Stan and I did, he actually used a uh, plasmoid generator to replace the spark plug and also a fuel inject, combination fuel injector and plasmoid the firing system. So. This is the same system that we use on the battery. I just wanted to go link those two things together. And next. And here you have the MSAT plasmoid generator here operating on the Caterpillar motor. But in this case, I think this was when we were doing the test work on the jet engine. So we're still using the same configuration. Basically, the air comes down through a pipe here and then up through these pipes. This here is just a water trap and then it goes into the, uh, uh, whether that's, you know, the caterpillar motor itself or a jet engine or any other device, this still generator will still work basically at scale. Next. So this is a uh, one of the motors that's in London at the moment. This is a test on that that people can uh, go and again, these will, this will, uh, is embedded in this presentation. You can see that at any time. Next. This clearly shows the same thing where you've got plasmoid generators here coming through the, the spheres here and the exhaust gas goes down this way, goes anti-clockwise, spinning vortex against a 
clockwise imploding spinning vortex. This sphere here can get up to temperatures of 800 degrees C, whereas this pipe here can be at minus 40. This pipe coming in the bottom here can be at minus 85 degrees C. So, basically, next. So, here's the, uh, again, another video with that in operation. You can see on the, the presentation, I'm going to go into that now, you can see it for yourself. Next. Here's myself running the motor, which is a gas version, where we're actually treating the, um, the tip leachates that are coming from uh, natural gas, producing biogas being produced from these uh, refuse sites for these rubbish tips. And this, uh, the, as the gas is collected, there's also fluid connected, and that fluid has a lot of nasty things in it, such as cyanide and uh, heavy metals. And uh, so, and our technology basically not only does it get rid of the cyanide and also a lot of the nasties, it actually then starts to generate ammonia by pulling apart nitrogen, which is one of the strongest bonds in chemistry, and two. So, and that's a whole other aspect of the technology that uh, is going into in part two of the notes, which are again in the, on, on the, uh, their website at strikefoundation.org. Next. So this is uh, myself, again, this is, I think, one of the first prototypes. Bubble here, UV generator is the exhaust coming through here, so we send it up and out there. And uh, here's all the uh, uh, gas analysis equipment. Anyway, you'll see this run in that video. You can play that at le your leisure. Next. So in Maldives, exactly, exactly the same, the same uh, petrol running. So throughout the world, we've tested this at different altitudes. And uh, this is at sea level. So and that is important because it determines that we can work in any range of environments and any that it's not affected by altitude. Next. So here's the Maldives engine again. You can see the same setup. And uh, this is... I'm just thinking, I guess it's possible that he really doesn't know like the exact wavelength type of numbers in a technical sense, but kind of came up with the let's say inventive concepts without the rigors of understanding of a broader scope of things so that he could feasibly theoretically come up with some invention without really understanding what he came up with i just i still don't think that wavelength things makes any any sense the that he would be that unaware of what he was talking about will be taking to India for test work there as well. Next. So, just different angles on that, but people can inspect at their leisure. Okay, so that's the last slide. Um, that's uh, now the next section will be... Okay. Okay, then. So, that's part six. All right. I guess this is going to be published a little out of sequence in my videos. That's okay. Alright, see you guys for the next one. Peace out. Till then.